Um, okay, so hi everyone, um, my name's Thomas, um, I'm Assistant Principal at Northampton College and I'm responsible for the School of Academic and Vocational Support. Um, Becca from Harlow College is also in the room, he's going to help me at the end if, if, with any Q&A. Um, and our presentation is around mass labs and clinics, so it's just to give you a flavour of how our action research has progressed this year. Um, it'll predominantly focus on the Northampton College model because we're conscious of time. Um, and the full report does contain a raft of student commentary and feedback that we got from various stakeholders through the process. And we've just picked out some key themes um, for you guys to hear today. Um, so the research came at a really interesting time for the college. Obviously, I'm not a maths teacher, so I'm so please don't hate me. I'm a maths specialist. Um, I'm here and I've looked at the action research really from a customer service perspective and also um, an organisational perspective. And obviously when I was landed with this action research, I looked like this little boy on the screen until I realised what was actually involved. And then I looked a little bit more like this. But anyway, we will move on. So I want to just talk you through some of the, um, the, uh, the comparisons between um, what we do at Northampton and what uh, Becca does um, at Harlow. So you can see a table in front of you. Um, on the left-hand side, it describes the features of the Northampton Maths Lab um, and the Harlow College Maths Clinic. Um, both are intended to um, deliver support to students in maths um, to help with their engagement, motivation and confidence. So the Maths Lab operates in a designated learning space outside the classroom, delivered by a coach. Students were sent to the lab by teachers or dropped in. Um, and sessions took place around the study program timetable um, and during the pandemic it switched face to face online. Harlow College, uh, the maths clinic was a little bit different where it took place in the classroom environment delivered by the students maths teachers. Um, um, teacher identified the student and then it took place after the maths lesson and my understanding is, is that sessions took place completely online. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of the Northampton maths lab just to give you a flavour of the space. And it's really difficult, um, as I've heard in presentations earlier today, we can't avoid COVID. It has had um, an impact on the data set that we've used um, when talking to students. Um, attendance at the lab, um, we began to measure it around November time. It wasn't being measured prior to that. Um, and to put it in perspective, we had a total of 366 visits um, over the year by 119 distinct students, but to put that into um, perspective, um, students at the college weren't really encouraged to leave their classrooms. Um, they weren't encouraged to move around the college. Um, the, the college moved away from functional skills delivery um, and looked purely at GCSE. So a lot of the in-year assessments kind of reduced some of our footfall. Um, and we had a lot more appointments um, and not many people um, reaching them. But despite this, we decided to crack on. So in terms of methodology, we did informal learning walks. So I'd go into the maths lab, try and observe some of the interactions, see how the students were inducted in. And we used student interviews, surveys, um, and focus groups. And we completed interviews with teachers of the students that were using the labs um, and the support staff to get an idea about shared understanding of what the maths lab actually offered. Um, and actually what um, all parties saw as benefits from getting extra support outside of the classroom. And also we were considering um, literature available to us at the time. So what do they actually do in those labs? So I talked to the staff in the labs and it kind of fell into two categories. So on the left were some of the activities that our staff did with our students that were really clearly syllabus related, um, geometry, angles, constructions, none of which I claim to know anything about. On the right hand side, we had more skills and personal development activities, which were a bit more closer to home um, from a learning support perspective. So I won't go through them all there, um, go through what's on the screen at the moment, um, but you can kind of have a look to see what our staff were actually doing with students. So we wanted to find out from students um, what they actually valued about it and what did they actually get out of using our learning labs. And on the screen, you can see the questions that we asked a small sample of seven students that had used the lab more than three times. So we were trying to interview students that perhaps had a much more meaningful experience in there. And the same questions were posed 
to initiate some discussions with them. What we found, um, and on the screen you can see a couple of quotes, and as I said earlier, the report itself has got lots and lots of student information in there and comments, um, that students really valued feeling being comfortable. Time was a really big thing that came out, and it presented itself with direct references or indirect, indirect references from the students. And they students seemed to indicate to me that they were struggling to process as much as they could within the finite period of the lesson. And we have to take into account that some of these students may not have had the best experience with maths in the past. Um, their confidence might be really, really low. Um, or for some of them, it might be the first year that they've ever actually sat in the exams. So we were really, really trying to give them as much as we could um, so that they could get the best out of their experience. There were also other considerations that we were taking into account um, in terms of processing abilities of students. And last year, um, last academic year, I know that we had a total of 1,000 117 students entered for the GCSE Maths, of which 198 students had extra time as part of, or specifically as an access arrangement, which was approved by the exam board. So whilst not being a maths professional, and I know this is gonna be a cardinal sin for you maths um, professionals, I used an online percentage calculator to tell me that, that was actually 17.72 of the overall cohort. So if that calculation is wrong, let's blame Mr. Google. So taking, into this, um, taking all that into account, we really were thinking about other things as well. Um, were we think in terms of the finite period of a lesson, are we actually assuming as well that all of our students were neurotypical? Um, or were there some maybe processing issues that were discovered? And at the time of the research, I just happened to go to a SEN, um, the National um, Association of Colleges Special Needs Conference, and they were talking about the forgetting curve and working memory um, and how different people can hold and manipulate information in their brains to different degrees. And I thought that was something really interesting to think about as we were going through too. We won't dwell on it in this because time is of the essence. What we did find um, through um, the research, um, there were some features that we wanted to explore further. Delays in delivery, students joining the college and finding their way to the lab often took time. Um, so we were missing some valuable times at the beginning where we could be giving them some input. Um, there was some queries around a student owners to explain when they arrived at the lab and um, sometimes without a teacher and we were relying on the student to be able to articulate what it was that they actually um, were finding difficult in the lessons which to plug. Um, some duplication in services obviously are, as part of my school we have various support services and we were kind of finding that different dis disparate services were delivering the same thing and we didn't know whether that was quite appropriate for the needs of each individual student. The staff were reacting as the students were coming in and we thought that's something that we could really do better. Um, and, and we wanted to kind of close the loop and keep communication and develop that community of practice and um, between what was happening in our lab and what was happening in the classroom. And one of the things that really came out that pre presented itself to me as a query was, is more of the same really helping with their confidence or do we need to look at those activities a little bit differently so that they can leave a session at the lab knowing they've mastered a skill and take that confidence with them back into their classroom. In front of you, what you'll see is just a really quick uh, mechanical kind of win that I think we got through the action research and we really wanted to have students coming into a service where our staff knew where their needs were so we did move away from a drop-in process into a tutor referral to kind of capture from the teacher, the professional that knew the student the most, where, where that student was struggling in lessons, what kind of activities we wanted to do with them. And then as we delivered that, we learned that it was actually really important to feed that back to the teacher so that they actually knew what they could do with them when that student returned to them in the lesson. So we had a teacher referral process and if students dropped in, which 
culture change takes time and we actually put them back into that cycle. Uh, we introduced an induction process so that we knew that the student knew where we were. Um, when we were online, that was about Google Classroom codes and actually talk them through in a really friendly way um, what we were going to do in the lab and that actually we, we were really there to help them and that lab time was a real opportunity for them for them to really learn get things wrong if they needed to and learn from their mistakes we looked at some alternative activities so we weren't necessarily just going over old papers so on the screen you'll see a couple of alternative complementary activities we started to introduce um, to try and get the students to look at it in a way which wasn't necessarily so associated with what was happening in the classroom, just to try and build some of their confidence and learn that they could do things. And actually, if they can do this, then actually the possibilities are endless for them. In terms of recommendations and solutions, uh, we looked, we, we're recommending that our access route to math support will, for next year, be only by teacher referral. and we. That will result in a discussion that will inform a support plan for them going forward. Any activity that delivered will be recorded and communicated back to the teacher. And on a bigger scale, what we've actually decided to do is actually centralise all of our math support services to create a powerhouse of support. So that actually has meant that we have made a difficult, but I think it's a really important decision for our students, that actually the maths lab will not exist within its existing guise next year. And it will look a little bit more like a support hub. And a support hub in our thinking is going to consist of maths and English teachers, um, academic coaches, and also our specialist teachers from our learning support team are gonna form a support hub so that we've got a lot more flexibility to cross refer to the relevant specialism. And that's going to follow a real rethinking around our initial assessment at the beginning of the year. So at the moment we've been using BKSB, which to some colleagues has been perceived as a blank tool. And we're going to be looking at access reading tests, spelling tests, mathematic tests and some time free writing to try and really identify better starting points for our students so that we know which of our um, strands of support and um, we're actually going to be offering to our students. And on the screen that you can see um, the three main strands that we are going to be offering. Um, we're going to be offering acceleration sessions really linked to the tuition fund opportunities that we've got at the moment. And that will be additional activity designed to complement the scheme of work. So we'll be working with students in additional sessions so that they can take some skills and knowledge into their next lesson. We're going to maintain our skills development sessions, which is more around SEND support, but we're going to be opening up that expertise um, to a wider range of students. And then finally, we're going to keep some of these enhancement activities that we've trialled this year, because we really, really want students to start thinking a little different way. We want to preserve the elements of the lab that really work for our students, but incorporate them into our support hubs. And next year, I think we all face some complex considerations because we're conscious of the lost learning and need to have some support in place at the beginning of the year. So that's kind of our journey and I've rattled through it because I'm um, conscious of time and there's a lot of text on the screen. Um, so I'd really um, welcome any kind of questions about our one stop idea, our one stop shop that we're looking to put um, forward next year. So thank you very much for listening.